Folks, um, welcome aboard once again. Welcome aboard the Empire Builder, and welcome to what is called the Mississippi Valley or the Cooley region. I'll come back to that in just a little bit here, folks. Um, I'm going to tell you all about the area between uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, where we just left, and uh, La Crosse on the southern end of this. Okay, in order to do this, folks, if anybody's uncomfortable with it, uh, you can separate from me a little bit, but I have to take the mask off, otherwise, all I'm doing is moving it up and down. So it's going to be off for a little bit here while I do this program for you. Um, anyway, folks, and then the southern end of this, where I grew up, the city of La Crosse. Uh, will be our first stop in the state of Wisconsin. Now, because we're in Vikings territory up here, folks, I'm gonna skip all the way forward because there's something very important that I have to tell you. When we get to La Crosse, right before we pull into the city, we're gonna cross four bridges right in a row. The first bridge is the Mississippi River. The second bridge um, is Swift Creek. The third bridge is the La Crosse River. And the fourth bridge is the Black River. Now two of those bridges are movable. The first one over the Mississippi, uh, which is a swing bridge, opens and closes on a center pivot, like so. And the last one over the Black River, which is a bascule bridge, which means it opens and closes with weights on one end to allow it to do that. Now right in the middle of that first bridge that we're gonna cross, the Mississippi River, folks, we're gonna go from Minnesota into Wisconsin. Now there's no set of, uh, there's no white lines, there's no sign, there's no lights, there's nothing at all to tell you you're going from one state into another. However, you will know that you're in Wisconsin, especially if you are a sports fan, because you will feel more like a champion than you do right now in Minnesota. <laughs> Sorry Vikings fans, can't help it. And Bears fans too. Um, anyway folks, so, that's way down on the other end. I'm gonna backtrack here. Um, the Mississippi runs for 2,170 miles from a place called Lake Itasca, Minnesota, about 150 miles north, northwest of the Twin Cities. And it is so small where it starts that you can walk across it. Okay, have you been there? No? Okay, you're nodding your head, so I'm like, this girl knows a little something, right? Yeah, that's cool. Anyway, um, it's actually so small that you can walk across it. And um, 2,170 miles later, it arrives in New Orleans, Louisiana. Now, when you look at a map, you think to yourself, well, it's not 2,000 miles from Minneapolis. It's not even close from Minneapolis to, to uh, New Orleans. Well, it is if you go by river, because how many times the river does this? Going all the way down. The Mississippi River is the largest drainage basin in North America. Now, what does that mean? Well, if it's raining in Williston, North Dakota, and it's raining in uh, Chicago, Illinois, and it's raining in Cincinnati, Ohio, all of that water makes its way to the Gulf of Mexico via the Mississippi and all of its tributaries, such as um, the Missouri River, uh, the Illinois River, uh, the Ohio River, just as examples. All of that water goes to the same place. When you think about it, it's pretty amazing. It really is, considering that the Mississippi does not start in a mountain range. And I'll come back to how it formed in a little bit here. But um, we're going to pick up the river here a little bit, folks. In just a little bit, it's going to be on our right. We're going to cross it for the second time here in about 10 minutes at Hastings, Minnesota. We already crossed it once earlier today, north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, and then we're going to cross it again for the third time, like I said, just before La Crosse. So we crossed the river three different times. Um, when we cross it here at Hastings, I want you to look for some markers out in the water, folks. Those are called buoys, B-O-U-Y-S. That determines where the main channel of the river is. There are green and red markers out there. And what I want you to picture and think about today as we make our way uh, southbound down the uh, river, I want you to picture yourself being the uh, captain or pilot of a tugboat that's 40 feet wide and 150 feet long and has 15,000 horsepower. And out in front of you are 18 barges, each of which are 30 feet wide and 90 feet long. And you have to navigate down this river at night. Okay? When you see those markers today, remember that any river traffic has to stay within those markers or they can run aground. Anywhere outside of those green and red buoys, 
Uh, the water is less than nine feet deep normally, and the big boats especially will run aground. Um, now, I mentioned nine feet, and that's really important. There are 27 locks and dams on the Mississippi River. All of them are between St. Paul and St. Louis. They're all on the northern half of the river. Uh, attention, ladies and gentlemen. This is your conductor speaking. Just want to give you some updates on um, how we are looking at time. Now, we are Gotta running pause for a minute, folks. just around five and a half hours late as of right now. There are times where we are able to make up a little time, or if we get stuck by behind traffic, then we lose a little time. You are able to kind of, kind of to see you know, how the train's moving. Um, we also will make announcements if we do get stopped at all. Right now, we're looking at getting into Chicago sometime around 9-ish. Again, that should stay that way as long as we don't hit any traffic. Um, we will keep making announcements if anything changes. If you're wondering about your connections, if you're going to miss them or what you need to do, ticketing is actually working on that right now. They don't necessarily have it all exactly figured out yet. They are working on it, though. They do, or they are aware of all, all those passengers that are um, needing connections. What you can do, if you do have questions right now, you're welcome to call the 1-800-USA-RAIL number. Otherwise, once you get into Chicago, we'll have you talk to customer service. And then another reminder for everyone on board, we do require that you wear masks at all times. Thank you so much for traveling, Empire Builder. Have a good day. Okay, so um, anyway, there are 27 locks and dams. Like I said, all of them are between St. Paul and St. Louis. And the reason for that is, folks, south of St. Louis, uh, the river largely maintains a nine-foot depth all on its own. It doesn't require a lot of help from humans to do it. Um, north of St. Louis, that's not the case. So these 27 locks and dams um, are there for that purpose and that purpose only, and that is to maintain the main channel of the Mississippi at at least nine feet of water, okay? Um, all of those dams were built by the Works Progress Administration and the Army Corps of Engineers during the FDR, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Administration, as part of his Back to Work projects during the Great Depression. Um, and they, you will see several of them today. Um, you're going to see one, just a brief glimpse of it, close to Red Wing. Uh, you'll see another one uh, north of Winona, and you'll get a really good look at a third one about 10 minutes north of La Crosse at a place called Dresback, Minnesota. So if you want to see those dams, uh, you'll be able to see them. Now, once we cross the river, we're going to lose it for a little bit, and then we're going to pick it up again just south of Red Wing at a place called Lake City, Minnesota. It'll be on our left-hand side, okay, not on this side anymore. It'll be on the left. And um, at Lake City, that is the widest point on the northern Mississippi. The water there is more than three miles wide. Um, something big started at Lake City. Anybody know what? Well, I know you know. You're from there. Yep. Anybody? Water skiing. Water skiing did not start at some exotic locale or a west coast beach or whatever. It started in Lake City, Minnesota. Now, how many of you have seen pictures of the Loch Ness Monster over the years? Um, right? Old, grainy, black and white. Can't really tell what you're looking at, right? Well, we have our own version of that here in Minnesota. That is Peppy the Lake Monster, and he or she lives in Lake Pepin, right next to Lake City, Minnesota. What's interesting is that the pictures that we have of Peppy look exactly like the pictures that we have of Loch Ness. Grainy, old, black and white, can't tell what it is, right? They did take it seriously enough that the National Geographic came out here in the late 1980s and spent about a month out here looking to see if they could find anything. There is a $50,000 reward out there somewhere, and I don't know how to tell you how to get it, but I, I would think you're gonna have to just about bring that monster in by its tail in order to get that 50 grand. For you kids that are in the audience, and I only see one, so pay it, oh, two, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> two kids, um, not kids at heart, just kids. Um, if you prove to me that Peppy exists, I'll buy you a free snack today. Use your imagination. I'm not going to give you any more hints than that, okay? I guess you have more so, um, anyway, folks, so I want to tell you a little bit about the cities that we're going to stop in today. 
Um, most people know a fair amount about Minneapolis-St. Paul, so we're going to skip that one. I'm going to start with Red Wing. Uh, Red Wing is our next stop. Red Wing, named after a 19th century Indian chief who wore swan's wings that were dyed red as part of his headdress. And that's where they get the name Red Wing from. Um, does anybody know what Red Wing is famous for? Boots, that's correct. Boots and shoes. Red Wing Shoe, headquartered in Red Wing, Minnesota. Their largest factory is located there. Red Wing, also famous for pottery. Uh, Red Wing was once the largest pottery making center in North America. You can still get pottery made in Red Wing, although obviously the operations there are quite a bit smaller than they once were. Um, I mentioned to you Lake City already. We're going to go screaming through another little town right after that, folks, uh, called Wabasha, Minnesota. A uh, famous movie in the late 1980s was filmed in Wabasha, Minnesota. Anybody know what that movie was? You know. Yeah, he knows. He knows. Tim Cargo, right? What's that? Cargo, right? No. No. It's on. <laughs> Grumpy Old Men. Grumpy Old Men was filmed in Wabasha, Minnesota. Wabasha also happens to be home to the National Eagle Center. Remember I said this is all considered a National Wildlife Refuge. Um, Back in the late 1970s, folks, there were only four mating pairs. Think about that. Four mating pairs of bald eagles left between Minneapolis and La Crosse. They were considered on the verge of extinction. Um, they started a major conservation program, the U.S. government did, and they worked with a lot of uh, local groups and so on, and it was very effective. We now have 1,600, just about 1,600 mating pairs of bald eagles between Minneapolis and La Crosse, and almost certainly today, if you pay attention, you will see some. Because mating pairs means, doesn't mean that there's 1,600 uh, birds. That means there's currently 1,600 pairs that are capable of producing more. Um, so there are a lot of bald eagles in the area. Pay attention, because they kind of tend to scare up as we come flying, uh, screaming through there. So. Uh, next stop after that, folks, is going to be Winona, Minnesota. Winona named for a 19th century Indian princess. Now, there's an old story, folks. It's not a true story. I, I've been able to confirm it's not true. Um, but it's a story nonetheless. Uh, that this Indian princess wanted to marry a particular uh, um, tribesman. Well, her dad, who was the chief of the tribe, would have none of it. He wanted her to marry somebody else. So to solve that problem, she climbed to the top of what is the tallest bluff in Winona, Minnesota, we call it Sugarloaf, and jumped. It's not a true story. If you want to read up on uh, Winona, there's a lot of literature about her. She actually was a very active woman in her tribe. Um, the story, we think, we think, comes from white people who were pillaging the land and taking their belongings and they made up this story to make themselves feel better. We don't know that, but we think that's kind of that's where that came from. But uh, anyway, folks, as a side note, uh, Winona Ryder, I'm sorry, Winona Judd was not born in Winona, Minnesota and was not named for the city. Winona Ryder was born in Winona, Minnesota and is named for the city. Um, our last stop along the route will be La Crosse or at least what I'm going to talk about anyway. I grew up in La Crosse. Um, La Crosse famous for uh, train heating and air conditioning. Uh, worldwide makers of uh, air conditioning equipment, TRENE, they are headquartered in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Also famous for having the world's largest six pack. Um, the former G. Heilman Brewery, now called the La Crosse City Brewery, they have six cruising towers. Um, they're each 120 feet tall and they are painted to look like a six pack of beer, hence the world's largest six pack in La Crosse, Wisconsin. La Crosse takes its name, you have to go all the way back to the 1600s when the French fur traders arrived for the first time. Okay, see the marker out there? That's what I'm talking about, okay? Now picture how narrow this is and trying to operate a huge barge coming through there at night with nothing but spotlights. Give me an idea of how Conductor needed to the 11 car. Conductor needed to the 11 car, please. Thank you. Okay, so, I lost my train. Anyway, um, French fur traders in the 1600s arrived in La Crosse and um, they saw the American Indians there playing a game that was very similar to the French game of La Crosse. 
So they named the area Prairie La Crosse and the name stuck. So a couple more things and I'm gonna tie this up here for you folks. Now I've mentioned the bluffs and I've mentioned the word coulee. That's very important if you're ever in this area and you refer to this as a valley, everybody from here is gonna know you're not here from here. And the reason is we don't call them valleys even though that's what they are, these are called coulees. What's the difference between a coulee and a valley? Nothing, just a word. But that's what we call them. These hills that we're gonna travel along for the next three hours or so, we don't call them hills, we don't call them mountains, we call them bluffs. Why? I don't know. What's the difference, <laughs> right? Same thing as with the coulee and the valley, who knows? Um, but they are bluffs. What's interesting to note about it though is that they were once mountains that were as tall as the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. They have shrunk down in size by simple erosion over the years from 15 and 16,000 feet down to 600 and 700 and 800 feet. Now I know when you're thinking to yourself, you're like, well wait, the Rockies are the same size they've always been. What's the difference, right? Well, the Rockies are made out of limestone and granite and marble, very hard rock. Just doesn't go very far, it doesn't go anywhere really. It breaks off and falls down, but that's about all it does. Most of this is sandstone, which is very soft and susceptible to erosion and that's what's happened. Now remember very early on, now here we go, the second crossing of the Mississippi right here, folks. Very early on, uh, in my little presentation here, I mentioned to you um, that the river doesn't start in a mountain range. How does it get so big? Well, the one and only thing that you have left here, um, reminding you that there were once glaciers in this area, is that river. When you're traveling down between the bluffs today, I want you to picture the whole thing filled with water. Not with ice, but with water, and there's a key reason for that. This whole area is called the Driftless Region because the glaciers never came through here. The glaciers split up right about where Lake Itasca is, big surprise, and they split up and they left this area alone. But as they were melting, the water formed a path, filled these bluffs, filled this entire Coolier Valley, and eventually got down to the size roughly that it is today. So that's where the river came from, and that's where a lot of the geologic uh, formations of this area, that's what the, her that's what the um, um, well, heritage of that is. That's where that comes from. So, um, folks, with that, uh, that's my little presentation for you. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, any questions from anybody? Did the glaciers form the coolies, or did they just build it? Did they what? Did the glaciers form the the, the glaciers um, left this area alone. The water melting from the glaciers on either side of it, though, is what uh, formed the coolies. What, and one quick thing I will tell you. Now, there's two lookouts on this whole thing that's very interesting if you're ever in the area. One is Barn Bluff in Red Wing, Minnesota. The other one is Granddad Bluff in La Crosse. And both are excellent viewpoints for this entire region. One thing you will notice if you go up to either one, and especially if you go up to Granddad just because of what you can see from there, um, is that you will look across at the bluffs on the other side and go, the glaciers had to come through here. It looks like they all got, like everything got flat topped because it does, it does this when you look at it. Okay? That's just the way they are. The glaciers never touched it. That's just the formations and how they've settled down. And of course, there's a lot of farming and stuff that goes on up on the top of those ridges. So a lot of the real rough ridges and stuff like that over the last 150, 200 years, as man has taken over the area, a lot of those have been flattened out for, for our purposes. So, all right. Thank you, folks. Enjoy. Thank you very much. My pleasure. You bet.